I'm going to start the recording now, and that is so we will all have an archive of our experience together this afternoon. You can go back and review it later. Uh, I think a, a, a lot of times in these types of sessions, somebody will ask if um, you will have access to the presentation slides. And um, I like to think of it as kind of one better because you'll have the recording, which will not only have my slides, but it will have uh, my voice behind it and any questions that were brought up during the session. Uh, so let's sort of officially get things started here. Welcome to managing the online teaching workload. I will be your presenter. My name is Tracy Miller, and I'm the online teaching coordinator here in the Faculty Development Instructional Design Center. My email is on the screen here, so if you'd like to reach out to me um, after the session, feel free to do so, and we can either talk more about managing workload or any of the te online teaching strategies that you would like to discuss. As to kind of kick things off a little bit, I'd like everyone to do, use the text chat area to introduce yourself. If you could just share your name, your department, and any online teaching experience that you've had, maybe how many years you've taught online or how many courses you've taught online. Just chime in. I can see that um, we still do have some people coming in. So um, hopefully they're able to kind of jump right in there. Otherwise, I might give them um, a little bit of guidance so that they can be a full participant in our session this afternoon. And that should be the case for Will. Will, welcome to our session. Many of us are sharing a little bit of an introduction about ourselves in the text chat area. If you click on the bottom right hand side of your screen, you'll see some uh, purple area, area and a couple arrows. Click on that and then click on the speech bubble uh, next to that and you can join our text chat area. Let's see who's here today. Kathy's been in nursing for 18 years. Um, still um, always grateful to have your experience in my sessions, Kathy. Good to see you. Um, Ryan, communication, not taught 100% online before. Um, so that's kind of my clue that you probably have done something in a, a blended um, format or maybe even you in use a lot of technology or Blackboard in your courses. Um, Alicia is with the Department of Public Administration and the Center for Nonprofit and G NGO Studies, mainly teaching hybrid, but I've taught two courses um, that another instructor designed. That, and that gives you a really interesting perspective, especially when we're talking about managing uh, that um, workload, because it's a lot about you know what is happening when the course is being taught. Um, online for 18 years, that's even better. Uh, Will, marketing, I have not taught online before. Looking forward to the experience. Uh, and I'm glad you're coming to the sessions and, and learning um, before you sort of jump into the deep end of the pool, right? Uh, Josephine, nutrition faculty, um, use Blackboard and have taught one online course for six years. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, a lot of disciplines today, so that's really interesting to me. Um, but we sort of all are coming together with um, this common interest of how to manage this online teaching workload. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about my focus in this particular workshop. Uh, what you see before you is what we call the online quality pie. And these are all the different elements, the different components that can really make or break a quality online course. And uh, today we're gonna kind of tap into quite a few of them. We're gonna talk about some design elements that will really help you in managing your workload, some things going on in the delivery, um, and how to prepare you in your readiness uh, to really be efficient in um, your online course. So hopefully that's what everyone is interested in learning more about today. I do have some objectives. Again, it helps me focus what I need to talk about today. 
and it's going to be a lot about practical strategies. Uh, practical, I, I want you to be able to put these practices into your course tomorrow, put them into your practice um, in your next online course. And it really has to do with being able to keep up with this always on type of course, uh, because that's definitely something a little different than when you're teaching face to face. Um, I want to be able to uh, save you some time, and you're going to be saving time um, because of these increased efficiencies on uh, maybe how you're setting up and how you're delivering your courses. Uh, Kevin, thanks for chiming in. So Sociology's been teaching online since 2015. So how did I break this down? Um, we're going to talk about things as it relates to design and how your um, efficiencies may also relate to the delivery of your online course. Grading is typically something that happens during the delivery of a course. And so um, it, it's usually combined in that delivery. Um, but I think it's important enough to talk about kind of in a separate way today because uh, that's what we spend a lot of time doing in an online course is the, is the grading. So that is how I'm going to kind of structure the workshop. And as promised, I will start by talking about what you can do in your course design. So what can you do as you're planning and developing a course that is going to help you, again, save time and be more efficient uh, in the process? And I see some folks coming in and out here, so I'm just going to give myself a, a mental pause and take some attendance at the same time. So my first strategy for um, designing an online course that's going to help your workload is use existing learning resources. I think many of us, when we're um, creating a online course, maybe for the first time or maybe one that we've been doing for a while, the first thing we think about is how we're going to um, create all the content. How are we going to take all of those PowerPoints that we've been using for many years and um, kind of bring that into our online course. So my first strategy is think about using some existing resources that are already out there. So here are some repositories that um, can really help you with that. Uh, the first one is OER Commons. That's Open Educational Resources. Uh, that's OER.org. OERcommons.org, excuse me. Uh, you can search and sort and filter um, for resources that are out there uh, specific to your discipline, specific to your um, level um, in your course, whether it's an undergraduate course or graduate course. Uh, there's even resources in there that are more K-12 focused. Um, but there's some really good resources in both OER Commons and uh, Merlot, which is another um, open educational resource repository that you can then just tap into and add into your online course. Now, uh, maybe you're still going to add some of your own um, content, kind of add your own voice into the online course, but you can start to build um, a really rich multimodal type of um, base of content because you're um, per pulling out some of these uh, resources that are available to you and you're again saving yourself some time because you're not creating all of the content yourself. Uh, this bottom resource, the Open Textbook Library, that is something that our um, NIU libraries have been working with and partnership with many other universities. And these are textbooks, they're digital textbooks that are available to students. So not only is this a way to kind of pull in some um, open free resources into your course, um, but your students are going to love it because they're not going to be spending a ton on uh, their textbooks. So some resources that go along with the strategies of looking for um, learning resources that are already created in your course. 
Alicia, your microphone is on, and that's fine. If you have a question, otherwise you might want to mute it, just so, um, again, we're not hearing the dog barking in the background or anything like that. So my next strategy is a way to organize your files on your computer. We're still talking about your course design. So this is, again, in the planning stages of uh, your course development. And the idea is to um, create some folders on your computer and creating those folders in the same way that you would structure uh, your online course. And it, again, it's going to help you to develop that structure. Um, you're also going to be able to find things very easily uh, maybe the next time you do the course or um, and you're going to refine your organization a little bit. Or if you need to um, email your students certain resources, um, really organizing your files in that structured way that you're going to add into your course is really going to make things much easier when you go to add your files and your resources into your course. Um, and whenever you kind of do these things, at first it seems like it's a little bit more work because you're building this organization, um, but then it's just going to save you a ton of time when you actually go to do it. So the way I have this is I created a folder for a particular course. Um, you know, uh, obviously, if you have several courses, you're going to have sort of several of these folders in your, um, in your documents, um, you know, however you kind of organize yourself on your computer. And then I create these folders for each week. Could be each week, it could be each module, um, whatever kind of term makes sense to you. You may even label them by um, topic because maybe things um, are going to um, be moved around a little bit depending on um, the rest of your design in the course. And then within each folder, you can create uh, maybe a Word document with uh, what your announcement's going to look like. Um, either um, a PDF of a reading or a resource or maybe a link to a resource, um, any instructions for an assignment that you're going to create. Um, another good one, I think, is to create a Word document with your uh, quiz questions. If you're using quizzes, tests, or exams, um, folks often um, will create their questions this way. That way they can really develop good questions and um, a good consistency of style across their questions. But then they always have that sort of backup um, Word document um, of their tests. So um, a tip right there, organize your files right from the start on your computer. So I did talk about if you have links to resources. And you can create a Word document, and you can just create some hyperlinks and add them into your that structure that you're creating on your computer. But another way to organize important links is to use these tools. So here's just a few that, um, that I've used, I've heard about um, others if you want to add something into the text chat area and um, share some other um, bookmarking tools like the ones you see in front of you, go ahead and share. Uh, these are some of my favorites. Uh, Digo, the one I have in the middle here, is the one that I use uh, most often and the one I use in my, my course. And what it does is um, it is just gathering into one place um, any sort of um, resources that you've bookmarked online. And so um, it's giving you a nice outline of what you've um, gathered for your course. Um, and so that gives you another place to kind of uh, keep track of them. I know one of the ways that I love using um, Digo is if Blackboard did go down, I can still 
um, give my students the links to those resources and they're really easy to find because I have them organized so well in Digo. Um, and by Blackboard going down, I mean sometimes a student will tell me that their Blackboard is down and therefore they don't have access to the course links. And so I'm just helpful enough to provide them with the links um, outside of Blackboard. Um, course that normally happens about an hour before a due date and, and they're claiming they can't get it done because they don't have the links. Um, Blackboard can't go down anymore. Black, <laughs> if you're thinking Blackboard's not going to go down during an upgrade, that is true because we have continuous um, deployment of upgrades. That doesn't mean that Blackboard won't um, have a hiccup and go down for other reasons such as um, an internet interruption type of thing, which is what the, the students are much less likely. Yes, I agree with you, Kathy. Kathy's chiming in on the, the text chat. So um, I often read out people's comments uh, so that they're available in the recording. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about um, how great these social bookmarking tools work. Another thing that you can do is you can add tags. So you're just putting a simple de um, filtering description into there so that you can sort your um, tags into um, a category. For instance, all of the resources that you might have uh, that are, um, I'm, I'm looking up Digo so that I can help Kathy out, see if I can get this up quick enough. If you have a, um, a tag that maybe is a certain topic and you'll be able to pull out all of your resources that are from a certain topic. Um, let's see, I'm gonna share my Digo library. I'm gonna use the application share. So things might look a little crazy at first. but then they should sort themselves out. Okay, so this is my library from Digo. And you can see these tags over on the, the side here. And so if I look at, for instance, my tags for module number 12, I can see everything that I've bookmarked. So these are links to things that I've added in there and I can go right to that link, but I can also add a little, um, some comments in there. So it could become sort of an annotated bibliography where I am adding um, notes and why I think this source is important. Um, I can also um, share them with my students, share them in groups like I've done here, uh, and the, my students can actually comment on and annotate different links for them. So I'm going to stop sharing so I stop making everybody dizzy. That's why I hate to I hate to application share on the fly because it makes things crazy. <laughs> Let's go back to the slide we left on. But I think I hope everybody likes our, our little tour of Digo there. Okay, so another strategy is when you're designing your course, finalize one module first. So as you're building it out, you're taking all those great folders that you structured on your PC and you're adding that content, adding those instructions into your course, try to build one out first. And then you can use that one that you really like that's the finalized one and you can do some copies um, and kind of just make some modifications, um, sort of um, week to week, module to module. But you're keeping that structure that you really like um, because you really built that one module first. Now, when I say one module, I don't necessarily mean module number one. 
Now, uh, module number one is often you're getting started, your early introductions, um, students getting comfortable in the course, but it may not be um, is content rich at that point. That might be something that you really jump into um, in, in the second or third week, second or third um, session. So um, that's why I think that build out a module that you think is going to have a really good structure from the beginning and then use that one um, to model all of your other folders in, okay? So um, it, it looks very similar to the, the folder structure on the computer we talked about. So if you start with something like, um, you know, your base, your module that the students are going to click on, that they're going to see at the beginning of a week. Um, and then you're going to think about what that structure is going to look like. Is there things that are going to be built directly into that module folder? And then are there other things that are you're going to link, um, do a secondary link to? Maybe it's the discussion board. The students can also find it in the discussion board area, but you're going to create a link to it um, in the module. Uh, that's a that's a another good best practice just um, for your students. So, but the time saver is to create that um, one module first and then copy and paste make your adjustments um, to subsequent uh, folders or modules. So as just kind of another transition about this idea of using a consistent template, maybe you're not building out a complete uh, module yet, but you're at least building out some sort of template that is going to be predictable for your students week after week. Um, Alicia, I think you said you were teaching a course that another instructor designed. This is a really good thing for those of you um, that are uh, designing courses that may be taught by other uh, faculty or instructors, or if you're on that end where you're um, interpreting the design and development and uh, this can help you understand that this is the intent of the structure. You can hide this from your students so only you see it but you understand that okay this is the way each um, module is going to be set up. So you know you're you're doing these highlights so it's kind of very glaring that this is meant for you um, and maybe not meant for your students so you remember to keep it hidden um, you can unhighlight it and you can just kind of um, cut your own text into it at this point again make it more specific for each module but the idea is each module is going to have this consistent template um, and so you can see at the top, mo welcome to module X. When you do the edits, you would change that X to the number of the module and then just keep building these things out um, as you go through. While you have those folders open on your computer and you're really just, you know, just cutting and pasting in a lot of these elements into your course. Another tip uh, that can be so important, think about when you're teaching in a face-to-face -face course and you're there to be able to go over an assignment, over the instructions, and you're answering the questions as they come up in the class. Um, because you're not seeing them in the class, you need to provide really specific instructions. So the instructions I have on this page are for what I call a learning tool exploration, and, and I actually have my students learn how to use uh, Digo. So uh, they're not only using it for their social bookmarking, but they're, they're learning the importance of having a, a tool like a social bookmarking uh, tool. But it can seem really strange to them at first because they really are um, learning a new tool and it's actually happening outside of Blackboard. So I try to be really specific in my instructions. This is the first learning tool exploration they do in the course, so that makes it even more complicated because they're sort of not at ease yet on um, 
really the freedom of doing an exploration of like this. So I give them some um, brief instructions um, for those that um, maybe are more comfortable with a little ambiguity in their instruction, but I also give them um, a download more detailed instruction um, along with a rubric, even though they can find the interactive rubric um, in the assignment and an even more detailed job aid. So it's more of a screenshot by screenshot um, type of instruction. And you know, it, it depends on um, the tool you're using, the type of assignment you have, um, but the fact that uh, Digo is a tool, again, outside of Blackboard, um, I give them a lot of detail um, up front. And here's what it is. There's a lot of detail up front. These instructions take some time to create, but you're not going to get as many questions about um, how to use it, um, what's going wrong, um, and then you spend a lot of time doing that, um, and you're losing that efficiency that um, you really want to build into the course uh, while you're delivering it. Last bit of um, advice on specific instructions is down here in the corner to use lynda.com. We have a site license here at NIU, so you can go to go.niu.edu slash lynda. If there's any sort of learning technology or um, kind of um, maybe slightly off content that you want the students to learn, save yourself the time. Don't um, write up a bunch of instructions and tutorials yourself. If lynda.com already has it, you can embed those instructions and those tutorials right in your course. A good example of that is if you need students to use Excel or if you need students to use uh, even something like Photoshop. There's a lot of great resources in lynda.com, so you don't need to necessarily teach them how to um, use Excel if you just want them to complete an, ex an assignment in Excel. Uh, my next piece of advice, use your date management tool. Um, to update your availability in your due dates. And this is specifically for when you are doing a course copy. So you've taught a course in one semester, now you've copied it into the, the next semester. Um, but one of the things you realize is that all your due dates are going to be off at this point. Um, there is that tool in Blackboard. It's under uh, Course Tools in your left-hand navigation. And um, it's the date management tool. And it allows you to either um, update your due dates based off of the first day of the semester. Um, you can update them 180 days to just kind of flip them into um, another timetable. The way I like to use them is actually to run a report of all the availability dates and all of the due dates. It's going to give me a nice list of what I need to change and um, I'm going to see all of them right in front of me and I'm going to be able to edit them to the due dates that um, make sense for the semester. Um, my due dates tend to be more day of the week specific and we're going to talk about our calendar a little bit, but it makes it easy to kind of um, just kind of move everything up to, um, in this case, all of these due dates are um, Saturday at 8 a.m. I'm just going to pick the relevant date in the new semester to make sure they match up with that Saturday at 8 a.m. Um, type of due date. Kathy says yes because you do the in, because if you, you do the entire semester, it doesn't count for spring break. Exactly. So um, there's always sort of that that Thanksgiving and that spring break that really doesn't make the the fall and spring semester um, work out as evenly as we think they're going to. Yes, it is a great tool. Um, I I did get sort of a round of applause when I introduced that to a group one time. 
So I want to give you a chance before I switch to delivery strategies um, to share any recommendations that you may have. There's a, a lot of experience out there when we introduced ourselves. So um, if you'd like to add those into the text chat area, feel free to do so. I'm just going to pause briefly in case anyone has something they need to share. And again, feel free to continue sharing. In the interest of time, I want to make sure I keep pressing on, though. So when you're delivering the course, when you're in it, when you're actually teaching in the course, um, you don't want to get too bogged down at the beginning um, by answering a lot of questions about what the students knew, need to do to um, move through the beginning of the course. So give them some pointers on how to get started. Um, this is often something that we do in that first course, that, uh, that first class time when we're teaching a face-to-face -face course. Um, so think about what they're going to need to do. They're going to need to read through the syllabus and any kind of general course information. Um, they, they might need to get to know each other. They are going to be interested in being introduced to you. But when they get in there, if you provide them with the normal default page, which is um, the, the sort of home page for the modules, they may not be quite sure where they need to go. And so then, and then they're going to send you emails. Um, save yourself the time of all the emails and be really obvious about what they need to do to get started. And the way to do that is to change your course entry point from the home page to this getting started page. And you can do that through um, properties and um, the, the teaching style area. And it'll just allow you to change your um, home page, your entry point to wherever really you'd like them to go. It could even be your announcements page if you give your students a lot of this getting started information in that first announcement that you send to them. My next bit of advice is to set clear expectations for communications. Um, I've sort of brought it up already, but if you want to reduce the amount of emails that you're getting back and forth, one of the first recommendations is to create a question and answer discussion forum um, so that students are able to answer um, each other in some of these ways. Um, it's one of those benefits of, um, you know, ask your dumb question in front of the whole class so everybody can uh, benefit from the answer. Uh, and again, it's going to save you a lot of that email back and forth type of um, situation that can happen. Um, let your students know that you're going to respond to all emails with a, a certain time frame. Here I'm saying 24 hours, um, but please be patient. Uh, that's so they don't think that you're going to respond immediately. Um, I had someone the other day say, um, well, they could ask anytime they want, but I'm still not going to reply to them until I'm ready for it. And that's perfectly fine. We all understand that that's us helping take care of ourselves and our workload. It's just letting your students know um, when they will hear back from you so they're not asking. Um, and again, let them know anything else. If you're going to limit the, the uh, days of the week, the times of the day, um, to um, kind of channel your time that this is when you are um, dedicating yourself to answering your students, um, responding to their questions, responding to their emails. Um, ask them to add in the course number in the subject line of your email. Um, and, and any kind of other um, etiquette that you're looking for in your course. I think it's important to have them kind of be trained into adding your course number. Um, if you're teaching a lot of courses, you got a lot of other things going on, uh, it really helps you're not thinking, oh, um, 
where is the student coming from and what course um, are they referring to? Um, I know if any of you have ever used our Ask a Question um, forum for Blackboard questions, it's one of the things we ask for uh, because then we can kind of already start to um, help you with an answer because we know what course you're, you're talking about, um, maybe what assignment you're talking about. Um, and so we um, often ask folks for that. And then now we've, uh, we've already lost some time because we're just asking for specifics. So any of that that you can kind of, again, train your students on are going to save you some time. Um, your syllabus, that's one of those early things that you do in your courses. You want to make sure your students have read the syllabus. Um, you don't necessarily care if they memorize it because as long as they know where to look for the information and they have some general idea of what is in the syllabus, I think that's important. But you can get at that a little bit by conducting a syllabus quiz. Uh, do I give points for this? Uh, you absolutely can. Students are still motivated by uh, getting points for things, um, even if it's just a couple points to kind of uh, motivate them. Um, to complete the syllabus quiz. Um, and you can see some of the questions here. Um, when are nearly all the assignments due? Hopefully that's going to keep them from asking all, all the time when the, the assignments are due. Um, one of the things I think getting back to the question on do you give points for it, another strategy to use is um, having certain content open up only after the students have um, completed the quiz. And so maybe they're not getting points for it, but they won't actually see the content that they need until they complete the quiz. It's up to you how you do that. Um, uh, I hesitate a little bit because if you do that, then you're going to get a ton of questions about where's all the content. So um, I tend to lean towards that. Give them a couple points if you think that's going to help them complete the syllabus quiz. Um, if not, if they ask a question that should have been answered on the syllabus or even directly through the syllabus quiz, um, throw it back at them. Tell them they can find out that information in the syllabus. Um, and if, if they want to be more secure in knowing what's on the syllabus, to go ahead and take that quiz. Another strategy, um, order your folders um, in reverse. So have the oldest down at the bottom and the newest up at the top. And that is so they see sort of the newest, most current content at the top of the page. It helps them and it helps you. You're not doing a lot of scrolling to find the newest content down at the bottom of the page. Really easy one to do. You can build out that structure um, in um, in sort of more of the chronological order and then just kind of drag those folders into that reverse order, um, saving time during the, the course itself. Now here I want to spend a little bit more time on this one because I think this is, this is the time saver that is really going to help you in managing your workload. And that's thinking about your due dates and your calendar. So what I have in front of you here is the Blackboard calendar. Um, anytime you add a due date um, into an assignment, into a discussion board, um, into a test, that due date is going to automatically appear on your course calendar. Um, so that's going to help the students manage their time. They're going to see when due dates come up. But when we're thinking about how those due dates affect our workload, um, start to map it out a little bit. What is your workflow going to look like? How are you going to establish a routine as you're teaching this course? And so here's what I do. I pull out that calendar. And I think, OK, on Monday, I'm going to send out my announcement. So every week, Monday, that that's my job. That's my task. I'm going to send out an announcement. Kind of introduce the week, um, remind the students to kind of bring themselves back into the Blackboard course. Um, and then next, I'm going to allow Tuesday and Wednesday 
to be my grading days. Um, and that for me is beneficial because I know that my most of my students initial posts on their discussions are going to be due on Thursday so all of my grading is going to be done before the students have sort of that next due date that they need to tackle they're going to get any of that feedback from me um, before they have that due date for the next assignment now Friday um, I might send out a reminder announcement, especially early in the course when I'm training those students to, to get things in on time. And that's because for me, most of my due dates, uh, final due dates are on um, Sunday at 11.59 p.m. So I'm building out this routine. I'm starting to establish this routine. What's going to happen the next week? Well, the next week I'm going to be right back in that same routine that I've established. So I know that, okay, early in the week I'm going to send out that announcement. I'm, um, I'm doing my grading. I'm doing my reminding. And it just keeps the, the cycle going. And I think in a face-to-face -face course, um, it might be more obvious to us because we're having those face-to-face -face meeting times. Uh, if we have a course on a Tuesday, let's say, we know that on Tuesday that's when we're going inter to uh, introduce the topics for the week. Um, maybe on a Tuesday students are going to be handing, on the, handing in their assignments from the previous week, and so we know our grading is happening right after that. So we're sort of establishing this routine around those classroom times. When we're in this kind of always-on environment in an online course, um, it really helps your workload to plan out and establish these routines. And again, it just becomes this cycle um, that's going to happen um, week after week, and we're carving out these um, this time for this, these particular tasks um, so that it doesn't kind of get out of control and seem overwhelming because we've established this routine. Um, next tip is if you're using um, a question and answer forum, which I recommended to uh, cut down on your emails, um, create this question and answer forum, but also subscribe to it. And you'll see the subscribe button. In this case, I've already subscribed to it, so I only have the choice to unsubscribe it right now. But by subscribing to it, what's going to happen is it's going to send you um, an email when somebody asks a question. So you're saying to yourself, Tracy, you just told me this is cutting down on my emails, and now you've told me to subscribe to it so I get more emails. But really, you don't have to immediately click on that email. It's just your little trigger that's saying, hey, a question is there. So I need to pop in at some point and get that question answered. So um, it does. It, it's not an immediate notification thing. It's just that um, kind of clue that says, you know what, um, looks like it's time to go in there and, and ask a question. Um, it also saves you time from checking the question and answer forum several times a day and then discovering that there's actually no new questions in there. So um, use that subscribe tool and then realize that um, that's just kind of your little clue. You don't have to jump in the second you see it pop up on your email because you let your students know that they can expect a reply from you within a certain timetable. Uh, another new feature just came out with the Blackboard upgrade is um, there's an additional in here and instead of just unread posts and total posts, there's a new column that is replies to me. And so that allows you to kind of filter through and um, see if there's been new post added in a thread that you've replied to and it's specific to you. So that's managing your discussion board um, in even a finer detail. I've been using it um, the last couple of weeks in the Online Course Design Academy I've been teaching and I am loving it. So look for that column. Uh, the Retention Center. 
So the retention center you can find in left-hand navigation under the evaluation section. Uh, what that is doing is that is actually monitoring some at-risk behaviors for your students. And so it's really going to save you time because you can let the retention center do its job and you do not have to uh, monitor these behaviors as much in your grade center. So for instance, if you're looking, you're uh, seeing your students' grades drop a little bit, um, you're going to be getting a grades alert in the retention center. Um, so what's happening maybe that um, is triggering this grades alert? And maybe you notice that um, the grades might be dipping because the students have not accessed the course in quite a bit of time. And so that is an at-risk behavior that um, is causing their, could be the cause of their grades dipping. And so you're going to be able to see this in the retention center. So it's again, it's taking a lot of this data that's happening, giving you this really nice at-risk table, um, but it also makes it quick and easy for you to notify your students that are demonstrating these at-risk behaviors and um, being able to email them right from the retention center, um, reach out to them, and um, maybe um, ask them to give you a call, set up um, a conference with them. Maybe it's just going to kind of shake them awake and get them involved in the course again. Um, it's also going to save yourself some time because there is a notification history. So if you think maybe you've emailed a, um, a student already about a topic and you feel like now you need to kind of search through your email to remember when you emailed them, the notification history, it's going to do that for you and let you know the last time you reached out to this student. Um, if you do everything through the Retention Center. Uh, so I like the, the retention center for that. Another thing to use, an, a newer type of tool, uh, it's been out for um, about a year now, is that um, if you are coming up on a due date and you can see in your full grade center that a lot of your students um, have already submitted their work, and you can see that um, over here in the needs grading icon that looks like an exclamation point in the yellow circle. But you've also noticed that some students have not submitted the work. And maybe it's um, four hours, a day before, something like that. You want to give your students just a little bit of a push. Um, you can now do this send reminder. And you do that by clicking on the drop down menu next to the Grade Center column title. You'll see the send reminder you can click on. It will ask you if you're sure you want to send a reminder uh, to the stu six students in this case that have not sent it. And you can hit OK, and that will send just those students a reminder that the um, the assignment is due. I will tell you, I tried this out um, this semester, and um, it worked beautifully, except for I wish I was a little bit more detailed in my description of the assignment so it was really obvious um, what they needed to work on. Um, it sends out whatever is in your Grade Center column title. And so, again, just be really specific with that. You definitely don't want to name something um, assignment A or something that might be um, more confusing for them to understand what they still need to complete. Um, although, they should just look back at the, the course schedule and um, be able to tell what they need to do, right? I'm going to pause again before I switch finally to grading and ask if anyone else has any recommendations that they'd like to share um, that they find saves some time when they're delivering their online course. All right, let's talk about grading. So we talked about um, pacing out our own, or establishing our own routine. Let's talk a little bit about some specific strategies as it relates to grading. So in the example I used earlier, 
everything had a very consistent, very predictable routine. But every week is not necessarily equivalent, especially when we're talking about grading. There could be times where you have um, a major project, a major uh, paper that's due. And so my suggestion is to alternate between hard and easy grading. So that'll give you more time if you have that more difficult grading built in there. So, you know, something that's going to auto grade, um, like a, a quiz or something like that, you might want to mix that in and give yourself a little bit more time if you're going to have something that's going to be more difficult to grade like a paper that's really going to be something that you need to comb through and provide your student a lot of um, feedback with. So alternate and then leave yourself some gaps in there so that you have some time for you to grade, for your students to be able to incorporate your feedback and then bring it back to improve um, subsequent um, work after that. Another great grading strategy is to use your Blackboard interactive rubrics. Rubrics can take more time to set up, but they make grading so much more easier when you're in the thick of things. Um, so anytime that you have built the interactive rubrics in your planning and your development, your delivery time, your workload at that point just became much easier. Um, any kind of detail that you can add into the interactive rubrics allow you to easily just click on those and your students know how they've met your expectations or maybe where they fell short of your expectations. Um, if they do need some more personalized or specific feedback. It can be on those things that you can really just tap into and you can add them into the feedback area on the bottom. Uh, this box on the top that I've outlined in red, this will pop open the interactive rubric um, into, a, into a bigger screen and uh, it might be something that visually um, is easier for you to use. But you can also click on something like exceeds expectations and it'll click that for all of your criteria columns. And either that you're done at that point or then you can just click on a couple of them um, that maybe they did not um, kind of exceed expectations at that point. All of these things are just speeding up your, your flow. In this case, this is a um, discussion rubric. A lot of times the discussion criteria we have um, has to do with length of posts and how many times they respond to people and if they completed it before due date. So you're really just quickly clicking through these, these rubrics and maybe only taking a minute or two on, on each of these for your students. Um, so those rubrics are really going to save you some time that way. Uh, this is actually what it looks like um, when you again open up that box and um, make it kind of larger for your students. If you just click on this expert at the top, that's where it's going to just fill it all in for you. Um, and then you can just kind of um, toggle into other areas if there's some criteria that they did not meet at this expert level. So I really like using um, rubrics for that. Um, another great way to um, grade discussion forums is to actually enable grading in a discussion forum. Um, discussion forums aren't always graded. Your question and the answer forum is um, not going to be graded because you're just that's more of a helpful um, area for them. But if it's content driven, Make sure you click that box that says enable grading and you add those point values in because it's going to do such a great job of just collating all of the responses for a particular student when you go in and, uh, and grade it. If you don't, you really have to kind of climb through all of the, the threads in the forums and you're kind of counting up somebody's contributions to a forum. This way, one click of a box to enable grading. And um, again, it's just going to make a really nice grading interface for you and show you all of uh, the discussion posts in one nice area. We're getting 
down to the bottom here, so I'm going to move through here quickly. Uh, but I will also entertain any questions that you have at the end. So kind of keep them in the back of your mind right now. Uh, use your embedded annot annotation tools. And uh, this is a, an assignment that has been submitted uh, in one of my assignments in my course. And instead of downloading it and adding a lot of, of my annotations, which you can certainly do, in this case, it's easy for me just to use the um, inline annotations tool, add a comment onto the student's work, add a quick comment, and then just post it. And my students can see, um, get some of my feedback that I'm giving to them. Uh, be thrifty with your comments. Um, in this case, this is a more of a draft version of an assignment. So my feedback, my comments to them, um, they're meant to be improved upon. They're that's part of my final work criteria is that they incorporate the comments that, that, that I've given them. But if it is a final work, um, then maybe you're not going to give them as many comments because um, if that is their final work. You're going to give them some input on why they received their grade, but not as much um, as these comments to improve their work. Um, especially in a, in a final assignment, how often do they really go, uh, go back as the course is ending? Uh, another great strategy is to use um, feedback phrases. Keep a Word document, an Excel document open. Keep those feedback phrases handy so that, um, you know, those typical ones that you um, need to give students time and time again. Um, your, your post is too short, you forgot to cite your resources, um, keep those resources handy, and then you can simply cut and paste them into your students um, for feedback. So in summary, as we are in the last uh, couple minutes, don't let time get away from you. Start to incorporate these strategies into your course. Um, this is what we've talked about um, coming at it from kind of three different angles. What are some of the things that you can do to increase your efficiency as it relates to when you're designing and bu building a course? And here's some of the strategies we talked about. How can you manage your time while you are teaching? And here's a bunch of different strategies that we've talked about through this. You can kind of comb through these in more detail um, if you want to go back and watch the recording. And then finally, how can you be more efficient in your grading? And we've talked about quite a few of these here. Here are some of the resources that I've um, gathered some of these things for. I'll send you these in my, um, my wrap-up, my follow-up to you, so that you have those available to you. And um, you can look up some more of these strategies that have been um, shared with you here today. Also in my follow-up, I will be sending you a, a survey. So um, I just added the survey link in the text chat area. If you want to do the survey right now, get that off your to-do list, um, then thanks. I really appreciate all of your feedback. I incorporate in all of that into my next iteration of the course uh, session. And finally, any other questions you have, again, I can hang out a few minutes, um, but shoot me an email, uh, connect with me and any of our social media pages. Other than that, have a great day. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. You are all welcome. Um, I'm glad so many of you are taking time out of your summer to be here with us this afternoon.